the search for the Guardians next manager continues on. I've lost count of how many days we are on at this point with an update. Uh, if you're on a cruise, if you're on a boat sailing somewhere and you were singing, you know, 99 bottles of beer on the wall or something, you'd run out of times to sing that song and what count you were on. But we'll talk about some coaches that will not be here next year. We will finally get into that AFL update we've been promising all week. No way. You are Locked On Guardians, your daily podcast on the Cleveland Guardians, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. New AFL for any of you. Uh, I'm kidding. Uh, We will finally bring it to you as well as uh, I'm, I'm gonna i don't have my tinfoil on me but i'm gonna get conspiratorial with these coaches today so you definitely want to tune in for some of that uh but first i want to take a second and say thank you to fanduel who today's episode is brought to you by make every moment more new customers get 150 dollars in bonus bets with any winning five dollar money line bet that's 150 bucks if your team wins visit fanduel.com slash locked on to get started and, and i'll say today would have been a perfect day to do it when you saw in a World Series game, the team is doing a bullpen by committee game. That's just odd. But uh, we don't have enough time for that. So let's let's just instead pivot and uh, talk about the firing, letting go of, however you want to phrase this, of uh, three managers today. Uh, all of them fairly long-term guys. Uh, Mike Sarball was a player starting in 1990. He's been with this team 33 years in a row player to coach and uh out the door he goes do you want to start with him do you want to start with rigo do you want to start with uh barnett i I got theories on all of them so why don't you go ahead and and give your first theory then uh so when it comes to sourball the interesting thing today you know paul hoynes wrote a, a really has a lot of information in his piece so i would highly recommend going and checking out what hoynes wrote but one of the piece parts and pieces in that is we were told that Sarabal declined the interview. And according to Hoyne's piece, though the, the wording's a little weird, so it still might be like, I'm trying to figure out if it was badly typed, where then he talks about how Sandy Almar also chose not to interview. But with Sarabal, he specifically uses the words that the Guardians declined to interview him. Um, or not maybe those specific words. He but was not asked to interview, to interview. after Frank <clears throat> down. So it had been reported the opposite, that he had chosen not to interview. Um my theory on this one, this is my least tinfoily take. Uh, they're getting close on the new manager. Or at least they feel like they probably have, you know, a list of three and they're probably waiting on council. And then if that falls apart, they go to the next guy. But I think no matter what happens, you got to clear some runway for new coaches that the new manager is going to want to bring in. And with them already talking about Sandy potentially moving into another roles, this opens first and third for new coaching. Yeah, they didn't. Again, they didn't guarantee for Sandy Almar specifically here. They didn't guarantee what spot he would have next year. They just said that he would remain with the organization. They didn't. They stopped at saying what it would be. Uh, Hoynes did write that um, he would be on the staff regardless of who was the manager. But I do remember the press conference specifically, and they didn't necessarily say, I guess staff can be an ambiguous word because yes. there's so uh, many. It, Ant- well, Antonetti stopped short of saying coaching staff. He didn't say he'll be first base coach or he'll be whatever. So if the new manager comes in and decides he's got different coaches for these roles, they could reassign Sandy to a different role in the organization, not on the everyday coaching staff. So that's that again, that could be a very ambiguous interpretation of, of how that was laid out. But that's how I remember exactly remember. Anthony stating it when the uh, end of the season press conference happened. So TBD on, on the Alomar thing. Um, yeah. I, I think the Sarbaugh thing, look, he's been here. Yeah, he has been here a long time and he has progressed through several different roles. I know some people who really liked him as a manager in the minors and wanted him to get an interview in the majors. It was interesting that the original report was that he declined to interview because I, I would believe that the same way, Alomar did that he wasn't interested because some guys just aren't. I mean, 
Sarbaugh is what, 56, I think? 50. Yeah. Yeah. Like he's still Younger. relatively young. He's not really a spring chicken. Compared to the rest young. of this group, I believe. Well, I guess Rigo is pretty young too, but. Yeah. Well, Rigo, definitely the youngest, obviously. Yeah. But, um, well, they're only two years apart, but that's not a lot. So I would not be surprised if, like, you could have told me that Sarbaugh didn't want the job and declined the interview. I'd believe you. And I'd also believe that uh, Cleveland just declined to interview him because I just don't know. He did a good job in the mine. Like I said, I know people in the miners liked him as a, as a manager. There are just certain guys you see that are not, I don't know. We, we don't know enough about Sarbaugh to necessarily say like, yeah. oh, he wouldn't be a good manager or whatever it is. So I'm not going to pass judgment there, but. There are guys who get stuck in that in between like third base coach forever role. And sometimes you get out of it like Troy Lovello. Like he was one of those guys who was kind of stuck in that in between land before getting the opportunity. Yeah, as. I mean, uh, Brian Snicker was like that in, in, mm-hmm. in uh, Atlanta for a long time too. So sometimes you do just need to be given the chance and we'll see what happens with, with Sarbaugh. It is going to be interesting. Like you said, he is, he is a long tenured guy in this organization, but I'm not surprised they want to move on from some guys because like you said, clearing room for, for new managers. I do think they have a list of who they'd like. And I think it's telling that they were saying the reports were they were set to name a manager already, probably by this time already this, this year. And they put that on hold because council became potentially available. So they slowed down their process and, and they slowed down their, their, uh, wheels and being in motion to hire somebody because they could get counsel. So they must have, it doesn't, doesn't tell me that counsel is number one, but it certainly tells me they, they are very interested in him being doing due diligence. Yeah. And, and no matter who they bring in, it's going to be a fresh staff. So it doesn't surprise me. So yeah, Sarva is number one to go. And then the guy who has been here the second longest was Mike Barnett, the replay coordinator. He was let go. Isn't Rigo technically been longer? Wasn't Rigo at like? Well, if if you go back to his his time in the minors, okay. I suppose, yeah. Uh, time, in, I mean, time with the big league club yeah. is definitely Barnett. But uh, yeah. I, yeah, I just think it's I think it's just clearing house in general. I mean, obviously they talked about keeping Sandy, so they value what Sandy yeah. brings to the coaching staff. They didn't name Carl Willis here obviously yeah. so like carl willis and chris valaka are still um up in I, the air what what their future is so you can infer certain things about how they feel about certain man coaches this way i suppose you know just to talk about barnett he is so there's two really interesting things here one he was a replay coordinator was his primary role but he also helped come up with the reports for hitters um he was a hitting coach for most of his career before this to, he went back with Tito all the way when Tito was managing Michael Jordan in double A. So he was a Tito guy through and through. So with um, with Tito gone, that they immediately moved on from him is, is kind of interesting. And three, he was actually pretty good in that whole replay coordinator role. Uh, you and I were going through the data. Like the league average of overturning was 46%, and Cleveland was 54 this year, and I think he was 58 over his two years. So, uh, you know, I don't know how much that is a team effort and how much that is just that guy, but he was actually pretty solid at that. Uh, you know, again, it, it's opening up coaching opportunities for others. It's moving on from a, uh, you know, one of Tito's dudes to, you know, just giving whoever the new person is a chance to hire their dudes. But he was effective in his, at least that replay role. He was. And like you said, that's a, is that a team is it a team thing? Is it an individual thing? I mean, Barnett, I think is the one that makes the call if, if he's asked and maybe sometimes he's given his input, whether if he's not asked, but I think any close play, you're always asking no matter what. And he, at the end of the day, Barnett's the one that makes that call. And let me tell you, the replay coordinator thing is tough. I think he does deserve some due credit here because you've got to make that decision fast. You're always seeing managers stall for time and other managers get kind of pissed when other managers stall for time on that. It's a point of contention. Uh, you've got to be quick and be ready to make that call. So you've got to be alert. You've got to be watching the right things. You've got to know what you're seeing and you've got to make the call. So that's a very snap decision. So for someone like Mike Barnett to be that quick and that good, I mean, like we said, that he is better than league average 
throughout his tenure here and better than league average last year specifically, that's a hard call to make. So give him a lot of credit there for doing that. I think a lot of it does fall on him. Um, you know, he has been with Tito for a long time, obviously. I think, I just think it's, uh, I don't know. You're moving on to a new, we don't know if these guys necessarily, you know, they're saying they moved on from them. Are these guys wanting to stick around without Tito? I mean, Barnett specifically, right? He's been with Tito so long. He may not want it to come back next year without Tito. Maybe he felt some sort of uh, allegiance or he didn't want to be part of a staff turn. We've all, I think a lot of people have been there in their professional careers that a staff turns over and they don't necessarily want to be there because this is not that uncommon. Everybody usually let, gets let go. But this is a unique situation because, again, this is not a team that's in flux. This is a team that, while they're young and they disappointed in 2023, they the expectation is they're still going to contend next year. And in, I think like we talked about with Zach and in, on from the athletic Two in earlier episodes this month, talking about the coaching search and the managing search that usually when there's a new manager coming to town, it's because things you weren't winning, like you're, you're changing entire regimes because you weren't winning. And that isn't the case for Cleveland. So uh, we'll talk about Regal Beltron a little bit more as we move on. And, and just these, this interesting decisions on, uh, why certain coaches were let go and maybe a little more about Valeka and Willis and why they're uh, still potentially coming back. And we were finally promised we're actually going to get to that AFL debate or the AFL update, despite what Jeff continues to tell us. You cannot quite put any money down yet on Chase the Lauder win rookie of the year, Kyle Zardo, but you probably can in April. But until we get there, uh, score early this NFL season with FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Right now, new customers would get $150 in bonus bets with any winning $5 money line bet. You've got the Cardinals coming to Cleveland to face the Browns, but they won't have Josh Dobbs. So I thought initially that Josh Dobbs starting for the, the Cardinals would be a fun revenge game, but he is moving on somewhere else. So who knows? We don't know who's going to play quarterback for either of those teams. So you want to know what? If I was trying to win... Uh, 150 bucks on a bonus bet. I would not put a money line bet on this Cardinals Browns game because it could be a bleep show. <laughs> Who's playing quarterback? Uh, but you can get $150 in bonus bets if your team wins. If you've been thinking about joining FanDuel, no better time to get on the action. The app is easy to use. The wide range of betting options that you don't have to use on the Browns, uh, including spreads, player props, over unders, and more. Visit fanduel.com slash locked on. To kick off the NFL season, FanDuel, an official partner of the NFL. I think for at least one more day, for sure, we don't know how many more after that, you can listen to World Series action on your SiriusXM app. Just search for the World Series, Rangers, or Diamondbacks to listen. It is pretty clear that Texas is going to go up three to one in this series and that could be it. So uh, things will start getting very interesting soon. Okay. So Rigo Beltran, I, I don't have much of Rigo Beltran other than um, I do remember him being in Lake County as a pitching coach and interviewing him several years ago and just listening to him talk about working with pitchers. I really liked him and I know he was um, part of their training staff in 2020 when they had the alternate site. I mean, he, for a while, there was kind of a, I don't want to say rising star in the system as far as pitching pitching coaching is concerned, but he was certainly um, earning the respect and, and rising up the ranks in terms of uh, his, his coaching status here. And I did like him. I know many that did like him. I, I know the pitchers that did like him. Um, thought he was a solid coach. I, as soon as... Um, Ruben Yabel left for San Diego. I had said that I think Rico Beltran is an easy fit to move into the major league role. He did just that. And uh, yeah, now he's gone. That's, that's the most interesting one, right? Cause I think like you said, Barnett had been with Tito for a long time and just may have not wanted to may want to move on without, without Tito himself. You know, he may want to move on to, he was a little bit older and then he's 64. He's the same age as, as Francona. And then Sarbaugh, you know, might just be time for a fresh start for him somewhere else. Like I said, I don't know whether or not these guys decided they didn't want to be part of the new coaching staff as much as Cleveland maybe decided to clear house to bring in a new fresh voices. Uh, the Beltron thing might be a little bit different. This might be where maybe I'll indulge your your tinfoil conspiracies a little bit more. 
Yeah. So the interesting thing is, you know, he's been here starting in the minors since 2014. So this is nine years in the system. This was his first year as the bullpen coach. And um, listen, the bullpen was middle of the pack, but it was also the most blown saves in baseball. Uh, we talked about, I went back and did the the dirty work and figured out like Emmanuel Classe's save percentage is, is lower than someone like Chris Perez, which doesn't make any sense. Uh, so why was there such regression? Why was there so much upheaval throughout the year? Um, you know, he got that role and it didn't go well. And it's hard to blame a manager because bullpens or, you know, a bullpen coach because bullpen coaches are often just like, that. that's a role a guy has for like 20 years and sometimes never moves off of it. He just kind of hangs out back there. Um, but in this case, it, you know, it is interesting. They're moving on that quickly. Yeah. The bullpen coach, I mean, there's a, it's very hard. I think we talk about this all the time. It is hard to know how much credit to give coaches and how much blame to give them manager to like, I think just like manager coaches do get probably more blame than they deserve and probably more praise than they deserve on a lot of things. The one thing that's unique about bullpen coach, and I don't want to throw the blame on Miguel Beltran for this specifically, because this is hard to get used to, but again, other teams figured it out and Cleveland should have figured it out too. Is Look how many um, pitch clock violations they had this year, right? That I'm not saying that's on the bullpen coach. That's on a staff as a whole, but a big part of this, this bullpen coach role is getting guys ready to come in the game from the bullpen and managing that bullpen. And like you said, there was some regression this year. I don't know if guys were not ready or they were ready or what, you know, you were seeing in the bullpen, but a big part of that does hinge on getting them ready. And he replaced Brian Sweeney, who by all accounts was also a very well-liked and very successful bullpen coach. Think about the bullpen coaches Cleveland has had too, right? They went from Kevin Cash, I think, I don't know, was there someone between Kevin Cash and Brian Sweeney? Did Sweeney take over that role when Cash left right away? I feel like there's someone in between. There probably was. I, I mean, maybe you can look that up, but. Uh, oh, that's bullpen. No, that's the most recent coaching staff. Those are two very. Successful. Able to be a bullpen coach or he, was he an assistant pitching coach? I think he was assistant pitching coach. Um, I know that Joe Torres, maybe because Joe Torres, you know, Joe Torres might've been the, um, the bullpen coach and moved in the Niebla's role in the Able left either way. Even if it's just Cash and, and Sweeney, that's a very successful line of Jason coaching. Beret replaced um, Kevin Cash for that one year, right? Wasn't Beret only here for a year? I think he was fired too, if I remember right. So, yeah. Yeah, he, he was fired to make way for Sweeney. So maybe that one didn't go as well either. I do remember that specifically, right? But so, but Sweeney and, and, uh, Cash were very successful bullpen coaches and look where they moved on to. So clearly Cleveland has a high bar for who can coach the bullpen. Like I said, that's, that's the one area where I, I do kind of maybe indulge your conspiracy, not necessarily, it may not be a conspiracy at all. Really. I think it might be a preparation thing and maybe they were going to clear the staff no matter what, but it is interesting. They decided to move on from him. And, and again, they didn't mention Carl Willis or Chris Valaika. Yeah, I think that does point to maybe having some more um, more intent to keep them, right? Like that there is. The Willis thing to me makes sense. I, I, I don't know about Vileka specifically. They at least thought yeah. enough of Vileka. I, I mean, I think it makes sense for Vileka too, because not necessarily what we think of them, but they thought enough of Vileka to interview him for the manager spot. Right. So that tells you they must think of him a little better, not a little better, but they must think highly of him. And, and the Carl Willis thing, I think makes a lot of sense to stay because um, this is the, he is the one pitching coach that a lot of these guys have worked with. And I think there's something to be said about having that familiar voice to this young pitching staff when you're hoping to lean on them next year to be successful. Um, all right, we want to talk about young pitchers. We want to talk about young hitters. Let's finally give the people what they want. They've been waiting for three days for this, this AFL update. So, uh, yeah, we'll do that next.
if it could be the last time for baseball in 2023, make sure you don't miss that on Game 5 of the World Series on your Sirius XM app on Wednesday night. That should be a fun pitching matchup. Isn't that, uh, I guess, Nate Evaldi and Zach Gallen, right? Is that who was pitching on? That would make some sense. That would be a good pitching Is that another bullpen game? Get under the ball. Pun game. I'm pretty confident of that. Let's see here, real quick. It appears my app doesn't want to work today. Of course not. I've had a very tough day with technology. Let me tell you. I don't know. Okay. Well, I'm not going to wait on that any longer. It's gonna. That's gonna upset me because my my uh, technology has failed me today. Anyway, uh, we're not going to fail you today on the AFL update. We promised this for for a couple days now. We've been bombarded with other information since then. But uh, so the AFL. First off, is AFL. Fall Stars game. I love that pun. The Fall Stars game is Saturday. Uh, I shouldn't say that. All the Home Run Derby is Saturday, and the game is on Sunday. The AFL All Star Fall Star Weekend is not like the MLB version of this at all. It is very much like a popularity contest. So, if a player down there is a a top 100 prospect and maybe isn't performing all that well, they're going to play because they're a top 100 prospect and they are playing in the Arizona Fall League. They are going to promote the heck out of that player. Uh, So performance isn't always indicative of a fall star spot. It is more like a showcase. My favorite term, right? So like Chase the Lauder, for example, he just won. At some point, you're the one who said showcase. It was not me. It was you. I did. And, and in this, in this instance, in this context, that is accurate. So as much as it pains me to say that, um, for, so for Chase Lauder did win co-hitter of the week last week in the Arizona Fall League because he hit a home runs in back-to-back days and he had a hot start in the AFL and he kind of hit a, you know, a little bit of a lull for a while. And his, his overall numbers don't look good on the surface, but you can guarantee that Chase Lauder will be playing in that game Saturday, no matter what his stats look like, because he is a, well talked about top 100 prospects same with Kyle Manzardo right now uh you can bet that both of them will probably be participating in the home run derby Manzardo certainly will because he is like one or two in home runs out there and uh Delauder said his fair share too so I think they'll both be in the home run derby we have seen some disc not discourse but we've seen some uh people trying to challenge not challenge I don't know I don't know what the right word for it is there are people out there who are are trying to say are trying to debate some of the concerns people have about Delauder's swing, because let's be honest here. If you've, if you've not seen Chase Delauder's swing, it might be hard for us to tell you over audio or video, but if you have seen it, you'll know what we're talking about. It is not a swing that looks particularly like, I don't want to say not normal, but it doesn't look like anything you've really seen before. Yeah. It just looks off. I, I compare it at once to it's like when you watch um, Rogue One uh, and Grand Moff Tarkin has bad CGI and it's that uncanny valley. That's what his swing looks like to me. I mean, I've seen the movie. I don't think I could necessarily uh, pull that reference off my off the top. It's of just when you see bad CGI, when something doesn't look quite right, that you can tell it's not real. The uncanny valley. That's what his swing is. It's the uncanny valley of swings. Yeah, there, there's a lot of people out there who do have concerns about the lottery swing. It is, it doesn't look like anybody else. And people might say, well, I know people, I think the misconception here is people are talking about his, the scissor swing, the scissor kick. A lot of guys do do the scissor kick. Uh, Mike Trout has it. Christian Yelich has it. I know Jose Altuve does. A lot of guys do the scissor kick for different reasons. And a lot of it has to do with, um, balance and timing which is everything you do in swings it's, it's just a natural it's not a it's not a it's not a co it's not a move hitters do that coaches will teach it is more of a natural action in your body that you're just comfortable with it's just doing something that is a nat- natural to you the scissor kick isn't what is odd or unique about delauder's swing it's and I, I don't even think the cutoff truncated finish is necessarily what's unique either like that part does look weird 
but I don't think that's the concern. Like pe- people are trying to dismiss the concerns by saying, well, he's hitting the ball good here and he's lofting it and he's hitting it hard. Yeah. He's doing all those things. Um, I don't even, I, we don't even know if this is the best pitching he's ever faced. This is not to, to say that we don't think the can be a good player. I think we both think he can. Mm-hmm. It's the front hip thing. That it, you'd have to really watch to see maybe, I don't, I don't know if we can get, even put a clip on YouTube because we'll probably get uh, some sort of uh, copyright infringement for it, but it's the front hip that fires early on him. That That is the most concerning is that um, he starts his, his rotation early and the scissor kick is supposed to uh, slow his rotation down so he can adjust the breaking balls if he needs to. And everyone says the, the front hip fires early because of He's cheating. The ability, cheating against, against velocity. And, and it's, yeah. it's a self-taught swing. He has always said this is a self-taught swing. So it's always worked for him. Nobody has ever had to like tell him to change it because he's never, he's never not performed well for the most part. It's just been injuries and, and whatever. So there's a lot of people out there who are trying to not are trying to disprove that. And, and, you know what? Bottom line, performance will tell all, right? If he yes. if he continues to perform well, then we'll just say, well, it's weird, but he makes it work. But when it stops for when it stops working, everyone's going to point to these issues. Like there's just a lot of people out there who are saying, "Well, I don't see it." I, a lot of people who are smarter than you and I see it that that the front hip is the is yeah. the big issue, and and we're time will tell. And it's just one of those things. Like on a basic level, what have we talked about? What for the last two years, this team unicorns. bets on unicorns and sometimes it works. Uh, but we also saw a lot of unicorns fall back to earth this year, and just it turns out they're a horse with uh, uh just something duct taped to their head. Um, <laughs> and he has the athletic traits and he does hit the ball hard. I just that swing is one that because of the angle and kind of getting out early, I don't see him growing into power. And I, I don't think he's going to have great power. I think it's going to be really hard just because the way things are kind of sawed off with it. Uh, could he be a great contact hitter, which is what everyone wants to hear because everyone wants to talk about more power in this system, potentially because the physical tools are good enough. He could be a unicorn. But at the same time, what we've learned over the years is, you know, not betting on a guy who does things that uh, is not the norm, that that is going to lead to struggles. Did we? Okay, but devil's advocate on that we did just have that talk the other day about how this team doesn't gamble on enough on power or higher upside potential they play it safe with a lot of their hitting prospects the lauder in a lot Can of you ways, argue that this is a little bit playing it safe i don't think because so he's... because the there is I'm... upside here it the, the question really i don't think the question is the talent I think the question is really just the swing. That's that's really what it is. Like the pow- the raw power is there. I don't I don't think I don't think he doesn't have power. He does have power. It's whether or not he gets to it. You know, I he gets he does get the ball in the air a fair amount. He does not have a real issue hitting the ball in the air. The issue I saw with him most in Lake County was the early hip firing and the way he truncates the swing sometimes. It caused him to have a lot of miss hits, whether that was a ground ball or hitting balls to the opposite field for a base hit that he probably should have turned on and pulled for a, a line drive to right field. So he doesn't, t- so that, that would be him not tapping into the power. We've seen, we see the exit velocities are good. I think he gets the ball in the air. I don't think power is necessarily the issue. It's, it's raw power. It's game power. That's going to be the problem. So he might wind up being a good contact hitter because I think he has control of the zone. So it's maybe it's a blend of, of a, a safe floor, but a high an uninspiring floor. But, but is it a safe floor player. because of the health? Like that's the other thing too. I'll say. Well, like, that's, you know, that's, the a health, that's a different story. It's for another day, but like, um, I don't know. I, I the, seeing him perform against, you know, real competition is going to be the calling card because let's face it, the AFL is not real competition. It is a glorified hitters league. And uh, that's why if we have some time, why Ryan Webb has really impressed me is because it is a glorified hitters league. So when a pitcher stands out, that stands out. But, you know, he's... I'd like to see if Webb is going to make the all-star team on Saturday because he does... He should. Yeah. He's averaging nearly two strikeouts per inning. Uh, He has been just 
you know, there, there's issues there as well, but his ability to miss bats in a lefty is, is really interesting because this league is a lot like, you know, Bradley Hanner, who they took last year in the rule five minor league portion is, is a, you know, an interesting depth guy in the system, but a lot of teams sent a lot of interesting depth guys for pitchers. There's not a lot of good pitching prospects there. Uh, so, you know, a lot of hitters are excelling and, I, the interesting thing with the lottery is this is by far probably the best competition he's ever faced in until last weekend. Last week, he was st- scuffling relative to all things um, for what you compare of a guy of, with his ability. But um, I think, you know, let, listen, we, we're low on time. The big thing is Ryan Webb is missing an unreal amount of bats when every single team has two to three top 10 prospects on it. Uh, any final thoughts before we put this one to bed? Uh, there were some questions in the comments we wanted to address. Rule five, rule five. Uh, the draft goes as long as teams want it to the major league portion until teams stop selecting players. I think the minor league is the same, same way yep. as well. It's minor league portion to that. And teams just keep calling players until the end. And, and there have been managers in the past who have been traded. It's rare, but it does happen. And it probably won't happen this year. Yeah. yeah it, we, the only one who switched hands was Melvin and, and the last few times that's happened, nothing has, but it can. So we want to thank you all for joining us, rating and review, downloading. It helps. Uh, you know, always hit us up with questions and comments. We will try to handle them and go, go guardians go.